now look to the other ambassador, Sir Roger Klein, for closing remarks in opposition motion. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, this is about the rule of law. And if you believe in the rule of law, you have to vote against this motion. Hearing, I mean, I applaud the extraordinary elasticity uh, of the arguments that have been used in favor of the proposition, uh, and indeed the awesomely self-contradictory self nature of many of them. It reminds me rather of a time when I was living in Russia in the 1970s, and there was a Russian dissident whose parrot escaped, and he went running to KGB headquarters, and he said, my parrot's escaped. And the KGB officer said to him, well, we haven't got your parrot. And the dissident said, I know you haven't got my parrot, but if it turns up, I just want you to know that I don't share its political opinions. <laughs> I also applaud the magnanimity of Tony Brenton and Yevgeny Chikvarkin in agreeing to speak in favor of a motion which they clearly do not actually believe in. <coughs> Tony showed enormous courage and resilience when he was ambassador in Moscow, and the Kremlin, over many months, and his wife Sue did the same, sent thugs to demonstrate against him, completely in breach of international law uh, relating to uh, diplomats. Um, and he was treated extremely unfairly, to use the word in the motion. Yevgeny was driven unfairly out of Russia. He had his business of 5,000 shops selling mobile phones taken off him by actions known as corporate raiding backed by Russian security forces. He too was treated very unfairly and to see them in harness together is an extraordinary display of tolerance on their part. Um, I'd like to deal a little bit with the arguments made particularly by uh, the president-elect and others uh, which essentially are that the West treats Russia too fairly. Uh, the problem is that's not what the motion says. Now Chris pitched all of his arguments on sanctions and he said that uh, it was unjustifiable because the sanctions were not targeted against the individuals who are complicit. Well he needs to go look at those sanctions again because that's precisely what they were. It has also been argued by him and others that sanctions are responsible for the economic malaise of Russia and are hurting the people of Russia. And that is a fundamental misunderstanding of what is happening in the Russian economy. Russia did extremely badly in the 2008 crash. It never fundamentally recovered from that as a result of the mismanagement of the economy by Putin and his administration. 70% of the Russian economy has been placed by Putin into the hands of the state and the hands of oligarchs and others who are his cronies. And he has actually stood in the way of the modernization of the Russian economy. Russia went into recession in 2013. That's a year before the sanctions were imposed. What caused, uh, and, and, and Russia has been in recession ever since then, and that's not caused by sanctions. The fundamental factor that then hit Russia was not sanctions, it was the crash in the oil price. The oil price halved, the ruble moves in tandem with the oil price, and so the ruble halved. That's what affects people in Russia, but it affects particularly those who are better off, who can afford imported goods. The people at the bottom of the pile weren't buying expensive imported goods, which are now twice as expensive anyway. Sanctions have had a marginal, but only a marginal effect. You can see this by looking, for example, at the fact that Russia's trade with China, since sanctions were imposed, and China, remember, is not imposing sanctions on Russia, has dropped by more than Russia's trade with Germany, Russia's largest trading partner, and Germany is imposing sanctions. Uh, I would ask Yevgeny, in his eloquent argument against sanctions in general, whether he would apply that to South Africa, where sanctions against apartheid over a period of time had an undoubted and very powerful effect. I'd also like to deal with the argument about NATO, NATO uh, 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 enlargement, which Tony expected me to do so. He's quite right in saying that he was on very shaky ground in saying that assurances had been given to the Russians that NATO would not enlarge. I won't go into all the detail. I've written about it, and you can look it up in a paper written uh, by, published by Chatham House called The Russia Challenge. No assurances were given. But the important point, which was made by a speaker over there about NATO enlargement, was NATO had no policy of enlarging. 
What happened was that free, sovereign, independent states that met the criteria uh, for membership of NATO came knocking on the door and said, please, can we join? And NATO was pretty slow to let them in because it did not want to disrupt Russia, and therefore it developed a dual-track policy of getting close to Russia, building up NATO's relations with Russia before enlargement, and as a result of that, it signed the NATO-Russia Founding Act in 1997. Go and look it up. And at that point, President Yeltsin agreed to the subsequent admission to NATO of the first East European states. Then in 2002, the Baltic states were wanting to join NATO. And again, NATO, George Robertson, the Secretary General, discussed this in Brussels in the spring of 2002 with President Putin. Putin went to a press conference and he said, that's okay by me, some of my generals are going to grumble, but it's fine by me. He then sent his foreign minister to the meeting in Prague at which NATO formally agreed to admit the Baltic states. The Russian opposition to NATO enlargement is an ex post facto story. It is not real. Um, I would like to uh, pick up, Chris, on one other point, uh, which I think demonstrated some of the inaccuracy, uh, or marginal inaccuracy in his argument, it is not true that I ran three half marathons with Alistair Campbell. Alistair Campbell is not capable of running a half marathon. <laughs> I ran three times with Alistair Campbell, a much shorter distance. Uh, I won on two of these occasions, uh, and he then spin the, spun the story to the press that he'd come out ahead. Um, I was very moved by the speech by the young lady from Russia. I'm sorry I didn't catch her name. It is really important that we should distinguish between the Russian people and the Russian state. And I feel very sorry for individual Russians, for her, for Yevgeny, for others, who are tarnished by the behavior of the Russian government and the Russian state. If this motion had opposed the stereotyping of the Russian people, I would have been speaking on that side. But this motion does not say that, nor does it deal with the events of 25 or 50 or 100 years ago. It's about whether Russia is being treated unfairly now, in the present tense, Russia the state. And if it's fair for us to be critical of the American or the Saudi or the Chinese government, then why should we suspend our critical faculties when it comes to Russia? My friends in Russia fervently hope that Russia will be judged by the same standards, not double standards, the same standards as we apply to ourselves and to others, by the same international laws including the laws on humanitarian conduct in war, under which you do not bomb hospitals in Syria, by the same conventions on human rights, which were signed by the Russian government. Ordinary Russians are angry at the levels of corruption in their country, and in Transparency International's International Corruption Perceptions Index, Russia stands with Iran at 131st out of 176 states. Is that unfair? Ordinary Russians are desperate to see better law and order in their country. And in the World Justice Project's Rule of Law Index, Russia comes 92nd out of 113 countries. Is that unfair? Russia ratified the European Convention on Human Rights in 1998. It has a judge on the Court of Human Rights. And last year, that court found on 222 occasions that Russia was in violation of the convention. Is that unfair? Should we stay silent over the killings of Boris Nemtsov, Alexander Litvinenko, Sergei Magnitsky, Anna Politkovskaya, and so many others that tragically and sadly uh, I can mention? I firmly believe that we should stay engaged with Russia, we should work with Russia, we should seek a constructive, cooperative, friendly relationship with Russia to the extent we can. But we will not achieve that by kowtowing to Russia or by turning a blind eye to the things that Russia is doing wrong. It needs to be based on fairness and honesty. 17 years ago, in, uh, on uh, the eve of the new millennium, Russia's new leader, Vladimir Putin, promised his people a number of things. A democratic law-based, and I quote, a democratic law-based federal state control by society over the executive to preclude arbitrariness and the abuse of office, truly free media, supranational universal values, including freedom of expression uh, and fundamental political rights and liberties, an active and merciless struggle against corruption, 
and an attractive investment climate and diversified economy integrated, integrated into world economic structures. Those were the standards that President Putin, not us, set for his administration. Those are the standards by which it is fair, the word used in this motion, by which it is fair to judge the performance of the Russian state, not a judgment on the ordinary people of Russia. But if we are not fair about this, we have no basis for constructing a rational policy towards an extraordinarily important country full of very talented, very cultured people who have made a massive contribution to world, uh, uh, to the humanity of the world that we live in. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>